It was absolutely pure chance, pure chance. And I remember the second day we were here, we went off for a walk and we walked up the path towards the barn, past the barn, down to the left, turned to the right, and there was Seaford Head, the Seven Sisters. And I just couldn't believe it, it just took my breath away. And yes, certainly there is a journey. So when I start off, I'm not sure what I'm going to find. But I normally go there when, when there's so much going on, you know, there's so much in my head and I just need some clearance and I need to connect with my creativity again. So I will go and I'll take my sketchbook. Uh, I'll go on my bike and then off I go. And I never know what's going to inspire me. You know, it could be just an old barn that's got, you know, marks, shapes, old cracks in it and I'll draw them and all of a sudden I'm looking at my drawings and there's a letter. My name's Sally Mae Joseph. I am a calligrapher, illuminator and lettering artist. I guess this started for me when I was about the age of 11. I'm not going to tell you how long ago that was, but... <laughs> I did have a love of writing. I had a love of making marks, even at that age. And I can remember at my primary school going and doing a handwriting competition. Um, I just, I can still remember that sort of feeling of sitting there, moving the pen on the paper. It was just something I'd always connected with. And the other thing I loved doing at that time was painting by numbers. I don't know if you remember those. I think they still have them actually. And sitting there and painting horses and dogs by numbers. And that really for me, I feel, is something that is still very much part of me. And it still is where I come from when I'm writing and painting. And then I, you know, I'll just carry on, or, you know, I'll just be looking at everything around me and sensing everything, feeling everything, taking it all in. You know, it could be a flock of sheep just coming by, you know, you just don't know. And from that, you know, you get inspired. You think, God, oh, you know, nature, you know, here we are. You know, oh, we like sheep. I think the thing of water has always been with me. And there's something that when I moved to Seaford, um, it came back. It was something that I had missed for a long time and realised it. So although Seaford isn't the river, it's, it's a bigger river and the river comes in at the Cookmere and that's a very special place for me. And the first time I came down here, I actually did um, a vellum for a rescue service um, that happened just off the coast here when a whole load of wood was thrown onto the beaches. And that day or the day after I went down there and collected some of this wood and the service that had come about to save this ship, um, I did on the vellum the next day. So it was, it was a fabulous connection work for the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. Again, that was very traditional work. It was calligraphy, lettering, written with a quill, on vellum, with a painted heraldry at the top. Um, and I'm still doing that, which is a, a huge privilege, especially living by the sea. I mean, that is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. First of all, did you know how lettering started? No. Well, we're talking about five and a half thousand years ago at least, um, man wanted to record things. He wanted to make a record of a transaction between two people, maybe a couple of cows for a couple of sheep. So he picked up some mud, he picked up something, and he made like a little pan. And then he took a wedge-shaped piece of stick and he made marks in that. And that represented three cows or something like that. And then he gave it to the other person. So writing was to record things. And then gradually, that's what the Sumerians started that, you know, all that time ago. And then from there, we get the hieroglyphics. We get the Egyptians making those wonderful, you know, we all know and recognize hieroglyphics as a way of recording things again. 
And then from there, the Greeks came along and they simplified some of those marks, some of those mark making that the Egyptians had done. And they became different shapes, different marks, different things. And then after that, the Romans came along. And this is, we're talking about two and a half thousand years ago. And they developed the Roman alphabet that we use in the Western world today. I needed to do something, so I enrolled in a drawing class because I knew that was something I was connected to. So I took myself to this drawing class and it was um, this wonderful teacher who inspired me to really kind of look at old objects. And the particular thing I was interested in was Egyptian um, artifacts. So I took myself off up to London to the British Museum bit of a scary time because I don't think I've ever been up to London on my own before. Took myself up there, wandered around the Egyptian things, was terribly inspired by the hieroglyphics and the colour and the, the images of that and did some drawings up there. And then I came down the stairs, I just remember it so clearly, and at that time the British Library was part of the British Museum. And I just happened to look to my right and there was this room and I thought, hmm. Something took me in there, not quite sure what it was. And there was this big wooden case with a glass top and I just walked up to it and I looked in it. And I get goose pumps now, just looking. And it was a 12th century illuminated manuscript. I don't know what it was. I think it might have been a Bible or it might have been something like that. But it had this amazing like black lettering, beautiful calligraphy. It had paint, it had gold that shimmered, and it was just like falling in love. I completely and utterly connected with it. And I actually love it when I find um, some good quality feathers, uh, gull feathers or smaller bird feathers. Um, but generally I will use goose feathers, feathers from a goose, and they come from the the flight wings, the first three feathers from the flight wing. They have to be hardened, so they go into hot sand um, and that hardens the quill enough for me to cut it. I'm now going to shape the nib by taking a slither off the side and then the final cut to sharpen the end. In that way and then down like that and there you have your quill feather ready for writing. When I'm writing um, out something um, like a poem or um, a formal piece of work then I do need to warm up. I have a little practice to start off with um, and then it does need a a lot of concentration so I won't have the radio on, everything will be quiet and I will focus on the words and focus on what I'm doing. Well after I had that experience in the British Museum um, I came back and I spoke to a friend of mine who'd been to art school and sort of explained what had happened and actually I didn't even know the word calligraphy then, I had no idea what calligraphy was. Um, so she said, oh, you know, that's calligraphy, you want to learn calligraphy. So I then enrolled for an evening class, local evening class, in calligraphy with a wonderful man who taught um, at the local technical college. And he taught me letters, he taught me the alphabets, he taught me colour, he taught me about gold. And in a very short space of time, I realised there was a much bigger world out there. The ink I use is a Sumi uh, Chinese stick ink, um, which is a very specialist ink. It's not the sort of thing you can go and buy at the local um, you know, news agents or art shop. It's a specialist ink. Um, and I actually buy it in a bottle, so I buy it already made up, ready to go. I 
found out that there was a um, degree course up in London that I could attend. I had three young children, how was I going to do that? But I managed, I made sure it happened and I went up to college part-time um, at Roehampton Institute where I studied um, calligraphy, bookbinding and heraldry. And that was a renaissance. It opened my life. It made me see the world in a much bigger place because I was introduced to things I'd never seen before. You know, I was introduced to not only people who did lettering, people like Donald Jackson, who was a great name at that time, but I started looking at art. I started to look at, you know, Picasso and all the greats, Paul Clay, um, you know, everybody who was a real artist at that time. So it's not only the lettering, it was the art that came in as well. <laughs> uh, yes, it did actually, yeah. Um, actually, the first thing, I was very, very lucky to get a teaching position in the college where I graduated from. So I went straight on and did two years of um, uh, teaching Italic handwriting and gilding. And that, that was a great privilege to be able to do that. Generally, I'll use a very good quality handmade or um, produced, mass produced um, paper with a very smooth surface. It has to be like hot pressed to get a very fine formal writing. If I want to do things more expressive, I'll use a handmade paper that's got texture to it. Um, very often, I am lucky enough to be commissioned to write on vellum which is a calf skin. For this um, piece of work, I'm using an italic hand. We call it a hand. Um, I would have studied it as a student, and there are hundreds of different ways to write italic. So then I was a jobbing calligrapher. And as a jobbing calligrapher at that time, you, I, was prepared to take on anything. I did a bit of sign writing to start off with, but not much after that. I would go up to London and work in the corporate industry where you'd write out, you know, name tech places and things in events. Um, I do wedding, I did wedding stationery, I did all that kind of stuff. Um, I also worked um, at the Chelsea Flower Show when they used to handwrite all the awards, but um, now the computers come in, so that doesn't that doesn't happen anymore. I guess the influence of me working on such an amazing project as writing out and illuminating the whole of the Bible um, made the connections of the time when I was a student and I studied, and I studied illuminated manuscripts and I understood all this history that I've just talked to you about. So, and also we learned that the, the church was the place where the manuscripts were made in the early sort of 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. They were Bibles, they were books of hours, they were prayer books, they were books that the churches would sing along to. And then from that, um, I guess my influence would have been there when I worked on the St John's Bible, because the St John's Bible was a 21st century version of an illuminated Bible. In medieval times, which is where our calligraphy tradition comes from, um, the scribe would do all the writing first. So the writing was done first, and he would leave the spaces for the illuminations, which would be with gold, and with color. Alongside that, my influences in manuscripts weren't just religious ones. They were the secular ones that came alongside the, um, the church and outside the church the scriptoriums started up and there were books, herbal books, medicine books, books about travel. There was a huge explosion, people wanted to learn, education came along. So books were the only way that it could be transported from one person to the other. So when I put a piece of gold on my work, it just brings it to life. It makes it, it gives it a different kind of value to people. People will look at it in a way and think, wow, you know, that's good.
Um, the whole project took 14 years from conception to completion. Um, I joined the project about two years in. I'd actually seen in the Telegraph paper um, an article about Donald Jackson, who was one of my tutors and one of my inspirations as a student, had got this fantastic commission, one of the best commissions in the calligraphic world, to write out and illuminate the whole of the Bible. It was by a, an American Benedictine monastery in, a, in Minnesota. So um, I wrote to him and I said, congratulations. And at the bottom of the letter I put, if you ever need the services of a humble scribe, then, you know, let me know. A gilding is, is really not one of my passions. I'm an artist of gilding. And um, to, to work with such precious um, material that comes alive when you put it on the page and when you burnish it, it just speaks to you after that. And on this you think that might be very thick gold, but actually the gold I use is very, very fine. Because he was always one of my mentors and to work for him had always been my dream but I'd never thought it was possible. But family had grown up, things had changed, maybe it was possible. Anyway, he phoned me um, and he said, um, what are you doing? Do you want to come and work on this project? Um, and of course, that was it, I was there. And I went for a three month trial and stayed for six years and I became his sort of master scribe. I helped him set up. I helped bring all the other scribes onto the project. I helped organise um, financial things to start off with. And then I became a scribe myself and worked for five years actually writing and illuminating on the Bible project. <laughs> And it is used um, by the Benedictine community as an educational um, tool. So it goes all around America. It's not been bound yet. It has been written in seven big volumes and it's written with quills on vellum. And a quill, let me just bring this in here, a feather. And this is what we wrote the Bible with. <laughs> I went back to teaching, um, which is one of my loves and it still is. I absolutely adore teaching. I have a passion for it and I feel responsible to help teach the next generation of calligraphers. a particular hand and you want it you know to be looking like an italic hand then there are certain rules you have to learn so but even so it never looks the same actually it's interesting on the bible project we had six scribes and we all had to write the same script it was a design script for the bible project and we all had to write the same i think to most people's eyes it did look the same but for us we could all tell who wrote what Sue's little arches were slightly different. My little flicks off the end of the letters were slightly different. So, however you write, your personality still comes through. And that whole thing of um, the S shape I first saw, um, and then I picked up a feather and I was sort of making marks with it, and the S came out again. You know, you've got sea, you've got sand, you've got sun, you've got smells, you've got, you know, the seagulls, you've got everything around you. And also, my name is Sally. And all of a sudden this S came out, it's S, and singing as well. I love singing, I sing in a choir, so the connection with music and sounds and shapes. 
all started to feel the right thing and as I made marks on my paper this S just kept coming up. I even put stones down and this S just came up. So I knew this was something that was going to I was going to carry with me for the next part of my um, creative piece I'm going to work on when I get back to the studio. I will use gold uh, when I get back to the studio because I just know it's the right thing to do, the right thing to use. It, it expresses not just light, but it expresses the feelings of being in a safe place. Being creative and being an artist, being somebody who wants to not be like a sheep, you want to be there doing something different. A place like that gives you that inspiration, it gives you that sort of spiritual connection that allows you that create, allows you to be a bit different. Um, and that's all part of that journey. You know, having that feeling uh, that, that holds you. Yeah.